Okay, our first speaker of the day, uh, Bob Dolder from Sun and Products. And Bob is going to talk about measuring tools, geometry, and surface finish. So I will turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I was really kind of pleasantly surprised, I got to tell you, that uh, the uh, grandson of Joe Sonnen was able to uh, say a few words to you. And then our, our, uh, the, the guy that is really the big boss here that runs the operation, uh, uh, Mr. Miltenberg. Um, so part of my first part of my presentation is what they talked about. So again, this is some things that, uh, that uh, uh, they've already talked about, the fact that, that it's been family owned, 690 roughly employees, manufacturing in four countries, those are the countries, and it's roughly 50 global distributors around the world. In the beginning, I know some of you might be old enough to remember this, or at least read about it, but uh, engines were required to be rebuilt every 500 miles. Gosh, if we could only have that today, huh? <laughs> and the way blocks were honed back then, the tolerances were anywhere from plus or minus two thousandths or a foot, whatever came first. And then uh, it was a handheld method. It was done dry with a vacuum. And actually, if you get to walk through this part of our building today, I'm not sure of the turd, but there is one of these honing machines with the vacuum in our little museum upstairs, which is where we're at right now. Uh, Bores were measured by ring and gap. And surface finish measurement was by eye or by the thumb. And unfortunately today, even some of us still do it that way. <laughs> now new manufacturing today, uh, you know, we're all aware, pretty much aware of the fact that the uh, new engines are very dependable which is cut pretty deep into engine rebuilding business. We all know that. Uh, new engines will last 200,000 miles plus. And the reason why they're more fuel efficient is because of the computer controlled ignition as well as computer controlled uh, fuel systems. So it's like a little guy with a timing light underneath the hood constantly making sure everything stays in time. And that causes parts to last longer. And we also know that parts themselves are made out of better materials. In our business today, uh, meaning our, our industrial business, we, have, we usually get prints like this when we're doing new manufacturing stuff and parts. And uh, this is what we look at. This is what we go by. And then we relate that back to, obviously, the rebuild business as well. The subject matter that I'm going to talk about today is bore geometry. And we're going to talk about surface finish. And we're going to talk about crosshatch angle. Those three things are very important. And I think it's something that uh, needs to be, I know it's been discussed in other seminars. But we're really going to focus in on those three things today. And keep in mind one thing about Sun and Products. We are a honing company. We are not an engine rebuilder. Which simply means, you know, sometimes we get calls into the lab, or sometimes customers call very upset because their motors blew up. And it's like, we don't build engines here. We hone stuff. You guys are the guys that put them together. You guys are the ones that are in control of all that. And what I'm going to try to show you today is how to get there with our equipment as far as honing goes. Let's talk about bore geometry first. If we look at all these different geometric things right here, like uh, barreling, bell mouthing, boring marks, ta uh, you know, tandem bores. Uh, and in tandem bores, you know, like your two cycle engines, for example, you know, with a lot of open holes in it. You know, how, it's one of the toughest things in the world to hone. Uh, out of roundness, rainbowing, uh, reaming marks, taper, undersize, and, and uh, waviness. All those things can be corrected with honing. You can also create those when you're honing. So it can flip either way. You know, and, and you know, like for example, let's take one here up here at the top, barreling, okay? 
we get a cylinder that looks like this, what do we do? How do we fix that with our hone? Well, we simply come out and we put that honing head where it's tight. So where it's tight is at the top and the bottom. So do you want to dwell at the top and dwell at the bottom and dwell at the top and dwell at the bottom? No. You want to extend it. You want to lengthen the stroke when you, when you run into a situation like that. Uh, new engine manufacturing me methods, geometry of boring. You know, this is what they look at right here uh, when they're building an engine, is the roundness tolerance, and that's the symbol for, for tolerance on a print. The straightness, again, that's the symbol. And the overall cylindricity. Overall cylindricity is really, really important when you're building a new product. And when you guys get them, okay, you'd like to be able to check that, but the problem with it is, unless you have a pat gauge, you can't. You know, most of you have good dial bore gauges, and we're glad that you use ours, okay? They're very good, but they don't check, actually, any of these tolerances. Torque plates, that's a requirement, pretty much, today, because of the way the blocks are built. I mean, if you really wanted to, to repeat what the manufacturer is doing when they build the product, you got a torque plate on it. And then torque setting specifications. Again, that's very important because if you torque that torque plate on there wrong, you're going to twist the block. Again, board geometry, creating a better cylinder board, torque plates with a gasket, proper torque settings. Make sure that they're, they're torqued the way they're torqued when you're putting the cylinder head on, because you're trying to recreate all that. Uh, head bolts with lubrication. You know, I've walked into a lot of shops and they, they're putting on a torque plate and they, they put the oil on the threads. Is that the best place to put it? Well, yeah, it's important that it's there, but the best place to check it, uh, to have the oil, is underneath the, the uh, head of the bolt itself. Because when you pull down on that, it's actually, it's stretching and it's pushing. And if it's dry, it's jumping on you. And where I really found this out was 22 years ago when I came to Sun and Products and we had a very highly sophisticated Ingersoll Ram torque wrench that could tell you the difference between the two. Uh, then correct spindle and stroke speed. You know, we, we can go over that many, many times, you know, what that should be. But again, you know, you guys are the chef. You're building the product. You need to know that information. Creating a better cylinder, okay? Speed and pressure. RPM, we all know what RPM is, okay? And then the strokes rate is determined by the bore length. So again, the longer your bore length, maybe the, the, the faster, a little bit faster we go on stroke length or the shorter the, the difference. Where, and again, it's up to you guys to figure that out. And you know, we can maybe give you a recommendation once in a while, but for the most part, you're dealing with the product. So it's up to you to make that determination and to fill out the application chart, which I'll show you at the end of this presentation. Stone pressure is determined a lot by not, not only the abrasive that you're using, but also the type of tool that you're using and the type of machine that you're using. All those items come into play when we're dealing with stone pressure. The best way to describe what stone pressure actually is, is think of it as a spring. And the tighter you make the spring, the more stone pressure you have. And the looser you make that spring, the less stone pressure that you have. And what that's doing is that's helping it feed into the product. Now once, you know, let's say you're using a particular machine where you're controlling that constantly, you have to keep up with it so the stone pressure remains the same. If it doesn't remain the same, now you're fooling around with not only geometry, but you're also messing around with, with, the, uh, uh, with the surface finish numbers. So all these things have to be considered when making that board geometry. Okay, Sun and Machines uh, offer speed pressure recommendations. Okay, again, we recommend. 
Like for example, you know, if you read our manual for some of our machines, it says, okay, set the stone pressure here and set the overstroke at the top at three eighths and the bottom at three eighths. That's a suggestion to get started. It's up to you from that point to make the determination where you need to move it to to make the best part. Uh, creating a better cylinder bore. Obviously, it's gonna be important to select the correct abrasive. First off, if you're gonna use uh, super abrasives like what is used in OEMs now, they all use super abrasives when hunting a cylinder. And with the super abrasives, you need the horsepower and the machine to develop that correctly. Uh, super abrasives work totally different than a conventional abrasive or silicon carbide or aluminum oxide. Super abrasives obviously are uh, diamond and CBN. Diamond is a mined diamond. CBN is man-made diamond. And we have both. Just you need to decide what you want to be able to use. Diamond, as a, as a whole, the way it's mostly used in most of your shops today, you use diamond, is it has some torn and folded metal. And you need to eliminate that, and you eliminate that in the plateau process, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Okay? Whereas CBN, on the other hand, doesn't have as much torn and folded metal, but you still need to plateau it. Now, when you get down to conventional abrasives, uh, the nice thing about conventional abrasives is that you can have a whole stockpile of them to create all kinds of different finishes. Well, that's pretty expensive when you do it with diamond or CBN, because diamond, for example, on average for a set of diamonds that may fit one of our diamond honing heads, you're talking about five to seven hundred dollars for a set. But I will tell you this little story is one of the first machines that I had sold like that to this industry uh, was in 2004. He bought his first set of replacement diamonds and he only needed one set because the other sets weren't worn out yet, was in 2014. So they last a long time. So it's basically your abrasive cost is up front. Again, you can, it's more expensive if you're going to try to create all kinds of different surface finishes. And the thing with a shop like what most of you are involved with is you'll take anything that comes through the door. If it's a diesel, a Cummins diesel, you'll do it. If it's a lawnmower, you'll try to do it, okay? Or if it's just an everyday run of the mill internal combustion engine, you'll do it. Okay, so you may have a, as many as 250 different applications and you're trying to figure out one, you know, one shoe don't fit them all. So you have to decide what you're going to do and where you need to be as far as abrasive selections. Uh, Sun and Products, we have over 200,000 or 20,000 stone part numbers. And believe it or not, we've eliminated a lot of those over the years. We still have the 20,000, but there were more than that at one time. Creating a better cylinder bore, the honing tool is important. Okay, what you're looking at right here, obviously, if we look over there, that's a glaze breaker. Uh, we don't recommend those. <laughs> One of the first uh, uh, tools that we made was this tool right here, which you'll find on our CK10s and our CV616s. Excellent tool, but it's basically what we call a lead-in tool meaning that the one stone is offset a little bit so it can basically come in there and take the tightest part of the hole first. Now when you, we get into diamonds, okay, this is a little, uh, little less expensive diamond honing head than this one is down here. This honing head right here, which is diamond, which we sell a lot on our SV15s and our SV10s, that diamond honing head is also a lead-in head. If you look at it, they're spaced all differently. And again, that's to force its way into the tightest part of the hole first and try to round it up. Now, when you get into a head like this one down here, expensive honing head, it's basically what's used in your OEM market. All right, we do sell quite a few of those into the racing industry. Uh, the 12 stone version of this right here makes very good geometry, uh, but you, most of you guys are here are not building NASCAR engines or Formula One engines, so you really don't need to go there. 
all right? Rigid tool must be used, moldable stones, obviously rough and finishing honing heads. We actually make a honing head for our SV30 model and our SV2400 model that you can put in a rough diamond and a finishing diamond or a finishing brush so it comes in on each cylinder. So you put it in at roughs, retracts, comes out, and you, put, and you do finish for, uh, you know, a much faster job. Tool maintenance, let's talk about tool maintenance for a minute, okay? A lot of people don't even, I walk into shops and I hold up their honing head and it's like, oh my gosh, you actually make a round straight cylinder with this? Because the parts on that honing head are wore out. And even though you can tell me, hey look, I can put my dial bore gauge and I'm within a few tenths, well, let me put my pack gauge in there and let's check it again and you're gonna find one heck of a difference. So I would suggest, and I know I run into a lot of folks that are my age and older that still do this, and they say, I can't afford no new tools, you know, I'm just doing this for fun, da da da. But replacing the tools when they wear out is no different than anything else that you do. If it's wore out, get rid of it, put the right, put the new tool in there. Now maintaining that tool, if we're using coolant, for example, in a machine, coolant has a tendency to get sticky, and sometimes if the refract number isn't right, it, you create rust on the tool, and the same thing happens with your dial bore gauge. And what I simply tell people is this, look, you wanna keep your tools good for a long time where you're not running into that situation, go get yourself a little bucket that the honing head fits in, and when you're done, and if it's going to set for two or three days, or even overnight, put some either WD-40 or LPS or something of that nature in that bucket and drop the honing head and drop that dial bore gauge down inside there. Because that's going to keep it fresh and it's going to keep it clean. Now I'm going to get a little bit off base here for just one second and talk about our other honing tools, okay? I know most of you guys in here have run or have in your shop our uh, floor model machine, like our LVB, for example. And back in the day, we used to do a lot of connecting rods, and we don't do that much anymore, but there's still some out there. In, in the description right here, it tells you, you know, how to choose the proper tool for the part that you're doing. And this is, uh, people ask me all the time, you know, okay, how do I choose that manual? Okay, first off, you measure the width of the part. And it, that, that, that part or that tool needs to be anywhere from two thirds to one and a half times the bore length. That's how you pick it. I've been in many shops over the years and I see people taking and doing a set of connecting rods and doing one connecting rod at a time. And that is wrong. The reason it's wrong is because the tool is too long to do one connecting rod at a time. That's why we do them together. Uh, the other thing that I've seen is this right here, which is open holes with a keyway or spline. And again, it's the same type of, of, of uh, choosing of the tool, but with that tool, we have what we call a double wide stone on it, so it can bridge the gap over that keyway. Back in the day when I was still in the shop, back in the uh, early 70s, uh, we used to do a lot of tandem bores, spindles for off of uh, kingpins. And that tool actually needs to be two times the length for it to work correctly. Otherwise, what happens is you get the tool all out of whack. Well, if you don't have a long enough tool, what you do is you cut the center stone out. So you do have enough. And then you don't run into this too much in, the, in our business, but a blind hole. A blind hole, you have to actually modify the tool and in the back of our industrial catalog, it tells you how to do that. We make mandrels that range from 60 thousandths of an inch all the way up to 60 inches. Quite a range. We, what do you got to hone? We can hone it. And when choosing the tool, okay, again, it's important to do what we talked about earlier. But one of the things that people, uh, that I'd like to show you is a little demonstration here. 
If we look at this, this right here is an outer round hole. And if we put the stones, or we put a guide shoe over here, and we put a stone over here, and we turn it, guess what happens? It turns just fine in that outer round hole. What kind of hole do you think you're gonna make? An outer round one. It's gonna continue that path. Now, back in the 40s, when Joe hired a, an engineer, he came up with the modern day mandrel, which is if you look here, you see how it's offset? Well, let me get this standing right. With it offset like that, the tool fits in there, but the minute that it gets to the part that's out around, it pushes it, and that's what makes it round. We also make what we call single stroke tools. Single strokes tools you guys may be familiar with in doing valve guides. Uh, they're a tool that has, is totally coated in diamond. They're adjustable a little bit, and they're not designed to take in at least valve guides more than about a half a thousandth of material. I've gotten calls over the years says, hey, I'm trying to either try to use it as a reamer. It's not a reamer. You can't take a thou, two thou, three thou, da da da, you'll jam the tool. But these are, are still used in obviously your market today. Back to bore geometry, okay? Uh, bore measurement. Dial bore gauges are the best method that we have and the best method that we can offer to the customer. And we use a two point type of, uh, of gauge and it has centering feet on it, okay? Now, when using the dial bore gauge, and it, it, you know, when you first hand it to an operator that's never used one before, you think you just put it in there and it's gonna measure right. And we all know that don't work. You know, you've gotta rock it, you gotta get it to settle, you gotta move it back and forth, front to back, and you have to find out exactly where that, is, that measurement is. Uh, and again, back to cleaning on these things, you know, I would keep them clean. The other thing is that's really important is maintenance on them. Now you can maintain our gauges because if we look right there, that carbide ball and these centering rings, they can be serviced. Now I had a, a customer, again, I'll tell you another quick story here, that came to me and he'd been doing it for 30 years. And he says, you know, he says, I used to really trust sun and dial board gauges, but I'm gonna tell you right now, there's something wrong here, and it just don't measure like it used to. So I asked that customer, I says, hey, uh, when was the last time you replaced that carbide ball? There's a carbide ball in there? Yeah, and it's got a flat spot on it because we're measuring abrasive. Every time we go up and down that hole, it's rub carbide's tough, but it ain't that tough. Okay, so that type of thing needs to be maintained. And those rings on the end, they can be turned and replaced. And when you get to the point where that gauge is, you know, five or six years old and it isn't measuring right anymore, it's real simple. You call up Sun and Products, say, I'd like to have my dial bore gauge rebuilt. You send it in here, we rebuild it, give you new pins with it and everything and send it back to you for half the price of a new gauge. So they're very maintainable. We do build them here. You'll see when you walk through our little tour today where they're built. Yeah, we do make stuff here. <laughs> okay, uh, again, testing them on a regular basis. What some of my customers have done it, just to do as a test is they will buy like a triple X ring. Everybody know what a triple X ring is? It's a highly precision ring that tells you exactly what size it is. And you set the dial bore gauge up to that and then you just compare it, and that will tell you whether or not that dial bore gauge is still working right. It's worth that investment. Uh, dial bore gauge uh, setting fixtures, we make a variety of them, and our range on the dial bore gauge is anywhere from 54 thousandths of an inch up to 12 inches, 
And believe me, some guys with some of the pipe that we've honed actually try to make them longer, but the problem is, is the tip over isn't right once you get beyond that size. We've made them up to 60 inches long too. This is the isometrics that a pack gauge will produce. We have one at Sun and Province. They're extremely expensive. I mean, most of them are up over $200,000. Most modern shops today can't afford that. So this is one thing that you're relying on us as a manufacturer to do for you as a honing company, is when we design our tools, we check them against this pack meter after we hone a cylinder to make sure that the tool before we bring it out is working correctly, okay? We do do that service for customers at times that want to have their blocks pat tested. It's not cheap, it comes in here to our lab and we put a lab technician on, us, on it and usually it takes up to a day to do the pat test correctly. There are a few people out there that have these pat gauges. This checks cylindricity which is overall geometry, straightness, roundness, things like that, okay? And, and again, it's something that we don't tell a customer he has to have, but it is out there. Okay, what contributes to bore distortion? Not using the right torque plate, number one. Number two, torque setting sink widths. Three, poor quality of the honing tools. Again, we've talk, we talked about that. Make sure your honing tools are in good condition. Uh, incorrect abrasive selection. Uh, now let's talk about that for just a second. You, again, the, we know abrasives, and if you're having a problem, you can call our technical people at the lab, and they will ask you some questions. I've been in many shops today where I've walked in and the customer says, you know, I've used these uh, EHU 525 stones for years and now they don't work the same, but it's because you guys are putting cheaper stuff in. You, nobody's ever heard of that before, have they? No, two reasons why I found out that they don't work it right anymore. Number one, it's a hard stone. What do you have today that you hone mostly unless you're honing 1960 blocks? You got hard blocks, so you need a softer stone. That's number one. But the worst thing that I run into is when some wagon peddler has come along and sold the guy a different brand of oil. Our oil is specced out to work correctly with our abrasives. And they tell me everything that they've done, and maybe they do have the right abrasive, but it still is not working right because they put a very inexpensive brand of oil in it. Oil's basically two things. Number one, it's petroleum based. So, and number two, it has a live microorganism in it. And it's the live microorganism in our oil that holds the abrasive in suspension and makes it work. And so what makes the oil cheaper? You put more petroleum in it, now you can sell it for half the money and people think it's the same thing and it's not because the petroleum is so light that it's flushing the grid away rather than suspending it like it should be. And that's the simple truth. Uh, next, of course, is incorrect uh, spindle and stroke speeds. You know, again, I, we get several calls, you know, boy, this thing's just squealing like heck, I'm using diamond. And the first questions out of our mouth is, number one, uh, where is the stone pressure set at? Number two, what's the spindle speed and what's the stroke speed? A simple adjustment of bringing up the stroke speed or bringing up the uh, spindle speed will correct that problem. And then, of course, I've already talked about incorrect coolants. Now, talking a, a bit further about not just oil, but in coolants, you can use coolants in diamond, which doesn't make the mess oil does, but there's, there's things about that that you need to know about too. And that is, coolant is great because it's less messy, and once you hit the size, the size is there and it stays there. It doesn't uh, cool down and change sizes on you. But there's maintenance that goes along with that. And the maintenance is you can't have algae growing in it. You can't have it sit for two months and expect it to be the same because it's almost like a swimming pool. 
you need to make sure that it maintains the correct, what we call refract number, and make sure that it's not growing algae. So there's maintenance properties that you need to be careful of when doing that. Uh, oil, on the other hand, again, it creates heat, so it's gonna shrink up, and then, uh, or it's gonna be hot, and it's gonna expand, it's gonna then get cooler, and it's gonna shrink. And by doing that, uh, you know, what happens a lot of times with our customers is they will know that and it shrinks this much, so they just take it to that overside and let it shrink back to that size. But again, it's all in what you want and what's best for your shop. You're the chef, you make the decisions. New engineering manufacturing specifications. Okay. Many of you guys have seen this before, but I'm going to push it harder now because of, you know, ring manufacturers today and the way rings are made today compared to back when they were made in 1970 when I first got into this business. You know, you could sin, sin, sin beyond belief and the daggone ring is still sealed. You can't do that anymore. You have tooled steel rings out there now, that top ring, okay? So you got no, I mean, that cylinder needs to be not only straight and round, but it better have the right surface finish on it. And if it don't, it could cause a failure. So these are all the uh, mathematic, this is what we look at right here as far as all the different measurements that's taken off a profilometer. And I know a lot of guys today have got profilometers and a lot more guys are interested in buying profilometers for this reason. Okay, if we look at this surface finish right now, it used to be RA, RA, roughness average. Okay, 25 to 30, we're good, right? Okay, the RA in this illustration right here is uh, 94. Looks pretty wild for 94, right? That one's 94 also. Anybody see a difference? I hope so. This one's nine, at 94. If we look at the RK value and the RVK value and then the, and the, and the R, R, uh, PK value, look at those numbers. 94 also. Now look at the numbers. Uh, the one at the top, RK, went from 322 down to 75 here. If we look at RVK, 102, 385. So you see why RA really is not an, an on, the only measurement we make. The only thing worse than this is probably using the fingernail. Okay, so we want to create a better surface finish. And I'm not going to give you numbers today, and I don't advertise numbers. I leave that up to the people that make the parts that go against this, and that would be the ring. Or maybe from your experience or talking to the guy in the shop next to you that's having a lot of success at that, those numbers, that's great. So if we look at the top again, we all seen what RA is, okay? Let's look here at RK, which is the core roughness. This is RK right here, guys. RK is basically the mainstay of what's there. That's the meat of it. Let's look at RPK. RPK is up here, okay? And that's what we need to have to help break in and seal that ring. And it's very, very low numbers these days because, again, we don't have uh, the type of ring that we had back in the day. RVK, RVK is a valley depth. That's down here. Valley depth, depth is what holds that oil, and that's what's really important. We also want to look at MR1, which is peak valley material ratio, bearing surface, and that would be this number up here. And basically, this is set as a percentage. It's not a measurement that you can actually physically change once you've established the other three. It's just giving you an average. 
of what the peak is. And generally speaking, that number is going to be between 5 and 10 percent. The other uh, valley measurement is where your oil retention is. That's where this drops off right here and it measures it down to how deep the valley is and what percentage that is. That percentage usually runs between 80 and 90. Again, these are all very important numbers that we deal with today. And if you don't have a profilometer, put it in your budget to buy one. And we don't even sell them. Creating a better cylinder bore. Okay, by plateauing. Almost all, well, all new car engines have a plateau finish. The reason for that is, it used to be, again, back when I first buy, bought a new car many, many years ago, you had to run it at certain speeds and then slow it down and certain speeds and slow it down. That was called ring break-in. Don't have that anymore. Rings are broke in by the time you're sitting in the seat. That's because they use this method right here, which is a plateauing method. This being the ring right here, and you see the difference here versus the difference here. And then you can see it obviously on the surface finish test also. Uh, a plateau finish uh, copies a broken in a broke broken a broken in engine. That's what it does. In the past, it was created with a ring, which we already talked about, and it eliminates the need for break-in. Rings slide on a finer finish with lower drag. Large valleys all. Uh, are, are created for the good oil retention, which we must have today. Okay, so I'm going to make you do a little math here. There is a formula out there, and I'm just going to use RA as an example. All right. Many times a customer will say, I've walked into shops, and they say, yeah, I use 150 grit, and then I plateau it with a 400 grit. Okay, and I take off a thousand. Great. Okay, so let's do the math on this real quick. If you take the existing finish and then the desired finish and you multiply or you subtract the two, that's your required finish, and then what you do is you divide that by 100,000. So we're going to give you an example. An existing finish was created with 220 grit silicon carbide in a cast iron block and it created a 20 RA. Next, we used a 400 grit silicon carbide to create a 6 R, which creates a 6 RA. So if we take 20 minus 6, it equals 14. We divide 14 by 100 thousandths, and that's how much material that is the maximum amount that we can take off. If we take more than that off, Guess what happens to all those little valleys we created for oil? It all went away. It's all gone. And many times, you know, guys, oh yeah, I got this nice smooth finish, and it might even seal up, but it's blowing oil all over the place. This is why. This is the reason why. You're using the wrong abrasive. There's a couple of different ways to create a plateau. One way is uh, by uh, uh, a rough stone by a, and followed by a finishing stone. Now, if I'm using diamond, uh, in a lot of cases, we recommend a 150 grit diamond, which creates a very, very rough finish. And then if we're going to use a diamond after that rather than a brush, we go all the way up to 900 grit. And it's basically very, very little that's taken off with that 900 grit because, again, we're going to destroy the under part of that where we don't have any oil retention. The other way to do it, obviously, is with a plateau brush. Now, a plateau brush that has abrasive on it and it's a nylon fiber, what that does is that gets in there and it, it not only plateaus that finish, but it also gets into that valley and it removes a lot of the, the dirt, and not only the dirt, but more importantly, some of the broken and folded and torn metal. And we, we want to get that out of there. Now, this is what our brushes look like. This is, they call it a brush. 
but it really doesn't do anything. It will plateau, but it doesn't get underneath and clean like ours would. Okay, I thought I turned that off. Now there is a brush out there that has a fiber in it that actually has an abrasive on it that you can in fact put on the end of a drill. Now, sorry about that. That type of a brush is generally used in one direction and if you're gonna do it that way, you gotta do, run it several times and that brush wants to be tight against the cylinder when you do that. Now I've even had some customers come to me and say, I've used that method and what I do is I will actually reverse the drill and do it by doing it in reverse, then it really lifts a lot of the torn and folded metal out of there better. Okay, now we do have a machine, by the way, our SV30 model, that will reverse the honing. Yeah. You'll see that later today. Cross hatch angle. Last but not certainly not least as far as, you know, what uh, is important today. And cross hatch angle is an important factor. The reason that it is is if you got uh, too much cross hatch angle, the ring spins. If you don't got too little, it doesn't. The ring needs to move. And it also is a carrier of the oil. And if it comes down too fast, that's not good. If it hangs up in the cylinder, it's going to burn oil. Now, there is a specification. Uh, it's usually, it's an included angle. And it can uh, specify top, middle, or bottom of the bore. And it re some cases, they require a consistent cross-hatch angle. Now, in machines that we sell in the aftermarket, meaning your type of a market, a machine that would do that, uh, create a constant cross-hatch angle, you're gonna spend uh, a minimum of a half a million dollars on, because the honing head actually has to physically stop for a split second before it changes direction. And that's where the cross-hatch angle flattens out at the top and bottom. There's no machines out there right now in your market other than the, the big industrial machines that we sell that actually do that. And if somebody tells you otherwise, they're telling a little fib. So, cross hatch angle, measurement of a horizontal plane. Now, a lot of the, I, I think some of the ring companies today actually offer a, a little piece that you can hold up against the cylinder and you can actually measure it. I would always recommend that you try to measure it in the center of the cylinder. There are expensive machines that can also check that. That is created by the spindle speed and the stroke speed of the machine. That creates your crosshatch angle. Typically today, and I do get in quite a few of the OEMs, I actually live in the Detroit area, and I can tell you most car engines that are out there on the street running today, that angle's 45 degrees and included angle. The uh, Harley-Davidson and the Subaru, I know for sure, are 60. And when you get into the thermal spray type and a hyper eutectic because of the fact they don't re really rely that much on the cross hatch angle, it's 10 degrees generally, sometimes it's even less than that. You don't have to have a lot of cross hatch angle because of the way that cylinder is designed. And then your diesel motors, 25 to 30 included angle is generally the, uh, the go-to uh, cross hatch angle for that. Uh, I've spoken at, to, at a lot of uh, race shops talk to those guys about crosshatch angle, and that crosshatch angle varies anywhere from 22 to God only knows. Again, it's their recipe, and they know what works for them, and that's what they like. Generally speaking, if it's a street high-performance engine that's going to run on the drag strip, which is where most of the race cars are today, believe it or not, it's not the ones going in a circle, it's drag racing. It's 75% of the performance business. And they use a, like a 38 degree cross hatch angle. Okay, let's move on here. Okay, now I'm, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna, everything I just talked about, 
And if I were in a shop today, in a proficient shop, I would create an application chart for all the engines that I do. I'm just going to take this and fill this chart out for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's start here at the top. Okay, I'm going to do a Chevrolet 350 cubic inch stock OEM block. The bore diameter is going to start at four inches and it's going to end at four inches and ten thousandths. My bore length on that block is going to be 5.34 inches. The material that I'm going to is in this block is it's ductile iron. And my surface finish requirements, I'm going to write those down, and it's going to be 10, 20, 30, RPK at 10, RK at 20, and RVK at 30. And I want to see my MR1 and my MR2 at 85% and 5%. I'm also going to write down the abrasive selection that I'm going to use. Abrasive selection is going to be, in this case, I'm using one of our DH part numbers, but that particular part number is a 320 grit diamond. And then the next is my finishing, which is going to be my plateauing, and that's going to be a brush. Amount of uh, stock removal with each abrasive, I'm going to take the full 10 thousandths out with that 320 grit. I'm not going to take anything out with my brush, but I'm going to run it for 15, 10, 15 seconds. And I want the crosshatch angle on that block because it's a street car to be 45 degrees. And here's one thing that I like to talk about, I waited till the end to talk about it, is the fact that, you know, every block that you see out there is going to be a little different from the block that you previously did. It could be a block that came out of a car that ran 100,000 miles. Well, what happens to that block over 100,000 miles? gets work hardened. So it's harder. Is it a virgin block? Is it a block that I bought from Dart or from World Products or somebody like that? Well, Dart will tell you right out, their particular block, they put 5% more nickel in it and they're thicker walls. So it's going to act more like a diesel block as far as the hardness goes. And I can tell you also, dealing with Dart for over 30 years, that they're not always 100% the same hardness. They're different. So therefore, a Rockwell hardness test, which is not the cost of like a, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I want to say. <laughs> I'm having a, one of those old guy thoughts. <laughs> I can't think of what I wanted to say here. The cost of, uh, of a pat gauge, it's not anywhere near that cost. You can buy them pretty reasonable. It would be something that I would want to put in my shop. I would want to have three things in a way of measurement. I would want to have a Rockwell hardness tester. I would also like to have a profilometer, and I definitely need a dial bore gauge. If I got three things like that, I can tell you what every one of my blocks are. And again, I, I'm just, for the younger guys in the room, this is your future. You need to be there. Next thing that I want to know is I want to know uh, what my feed rate is, where I set it at, and in this case I picked two. My tool speed, my rough and finish tool speed is going to be 300 RPMs rough, 250 finish, and then my stroke speed rough and finish is going to be 80 strokes a minute, or 80, uh, I got that wrong, 80 RPMs and 40 strokes per minute. Extra information that I need to know about that block. Okay, it's a small block Chevy. What do we need to know about a small block Chevy? Sometimes we have to go down there and we have to relieve the bottom of the block. So I put that in my notes. So now I have the application. I can put that in my file. I can put it on an Excel file. I can also hand it to the customer and say, this is what I did and these were the results. And you're not going to have very many failures, at least from the part that you did. Now, they can do a lot of stuff to that block after they put it in that can damage it. But my part of the, the job was done right, done complete, and now I have a file that proves it. So I can't emphasize this enough 
that having an application on whatever you do in the machining business is really important these days, especially because we have so many friggin' lawyers out there. <laughs> okay, these are the SV machines. Okay, uh, Sunnet offers a, a large variety of honing machines, obviously, uh, and you'll get to see these all today. They're actually in the lab on your little tour, uh, but we offer the SV15. The SV15 is the great-grandfather of the CK10. And then, of course, there's our model SV30, and there's also our model uh, SV2410, which is production, high production type of uh, situations. Uh, you know, we also offer, besides these, obviously in your industry, we offer the line hone, and we also offer the LBB, which you guys re nicely refer to as a connecting rod machine. It's actually a pedestal machine. And uh, we also offer some very different varieties in the pedestal machine for higher production uh, folks. Uh, these all, all of our machines offer a, some type of bore, bore profile, and the bore, bore, bore profile is shown on both sides of the bore. Uh, it's also offered in many languages. As you've seen earlier, we uh, sell all over the world. And they're all CNC or PC, PLC controlled and operator training and service in your shop. And one thing about Sun and Products, you may not get somebody on the phone right away here, but we will, do take care of our customers. If you have a question, we'll get you an answer. And we have Mary, we have so much experience in this place, it's unbelievable. The day before yesterday, they gave away some awards for people that have been here for 40 years, 35 years. There's been somebody here as long as 45 years. So there's all kind of experience at Sun and Products to help you in your needs. <clears throat> and that's it. And I'd like to entertain any questions that you might have about anything related to honing. <laughs>